I just want to give a big warm welcome to everybody coming this evening. It's a lovely warm evening in Staple Inn. Um, and it's good to see so many here for the Hot Topics event, which we've got three excellent papers. Um, it will be, I'm looking forward to the discussion as well. The, the first paper I'm going to introduce is, um, is Digital Technology and Disability Claims. Um, by, it's written by Adele Groyer and Ross Campbell uh, from Genry. Uh, Adele Groyer heads up the Genry London's uh, branch pricing and research team. She's responsible for general research and client specific quotations for income protection as well as life, long term care, and critical illness business sold in the UK and Ireland. She's currently a member of the IFOA Health and Care Board and the CMI Assurances Committee. Before joining Genry in 19, uh, 2008, she worked for Old Mutual in South Africa. Adele holds a Bachelor of Business Science degree from the University of Cape Town and became a Fellow of the Institute of Fac Faculty of Actuaries in 2005. Ross Campbell is Chief, Actu uh, Chief Underwriter, Research and Development at Gen, Gen Re Health and Care, based in London. His varied role involved medical and non-medical risk research, including digital innovation. For, for 10 years, Ross was Chief Underwriter uh, for Gen Re UK, responsible for claims and underwriting client services. Ross has worked in reinsurance for more than 30 years, both in the UK and overseas markets. As a chartered insurer, holds the Assurance Medical Society Diploma in Medical Underwriting and is a senior examiner for the Chartered Insurance Institute in London. So I'll pass over to Adele, Adele and Ross. Good evening everyone and thank you for coming out to, to hear the, the papers tonight. I'm certainly looking forward to the speakers who follow and it's always wonderful to, to speak first so that you can enjoy the rest of the evening and, and focus on the other talks. Uh, so uh, what Ross and I would like to present tonight is research into a very specific area. Uh, so that is uh, using digital technology in the area of disability claims. So there's been a lot of very good research and, and many presentations about how digital technology can improve many aspects of the insurance industry. Uh, but we felt that this area was perhaps uh, had been explored in less detail. And it is something that we spend quite a lot of time working with. So in my role, uh, pricing and designing disability products, working with claims managers, and in Ross's role, uh, underwriting and now day-to-day -day interactions with uh, digital startups looking to expand into the space. So in setting out to write this paper, we had some questions in mind, and, and the paper itself has got some questions as headings. Uh, but tonight we thought that there were four key questions that would uh, set out uh, the, the key messages that we would like to leave with you. So the first one is, what is digital health? Um, many landscapes rely on having common terminology, so we'd like to share with you uh, what the key features of this environment are. And then we'll turn our attention specifically to the disability claim space and describe how there are many parallels with the health and care space where this technology is also being considered and that there are many strategic initiatives there. There's always a danger in trying to find a problem to use your technology to solve, so we're very conscious that we need to think carefully about what are the problems in the disability claim space where a solution may involve digital technology. We'll then touch on some specific examples where uh, we see this, this technology going and finally finish on how do we actually get this over the line and implement it. It's very early days and many countries are looking to others thinking that everyone else is ahead of them. So how do we actually get this over the line? So how do we describe the digital health landscape? Uh, I've used the word disciplines because that, that, that's, that's a word that was in somebody's website that, uh, that looked a, a very good way of describing it. So, so uh, what digital health is trying to do is to use information and communication technologies in order to improve health and care outcomes. And there are five ways that in which I'm going to describe this, that this does this and I'm going to focus on four of them. 
So uh, first of all, uh, health information technology, that's all about having a system where you can transfer data from one domain to another, for instance, exchanging information between doctors or between patients. Uh, so we would all have heard about the aspiration to have good electronic health records, obviously with all the complications around data security and privacy. The second area many of us will be familiar with uh, is uh, mHealth or mobile health. Uh, so this is where we're able to use mobile phones in order to uh, have a medical interaction. So that could be something as simple as an appointment reminder from your doctor coming to your mobile phone, uh, or it could be that you're accessing health advice via your phone. Telehealth is a very broad area, so that's specifically looking at uh, remote interactions. So there are subsets of telehealth. So one of them is telemedicine. So that is where you have a clinical consultation in a remote setting so the doctor is somewhere other than where the patient is. Telecare is rather than the clinical con uh, consultation care. So if somebody is, for example, in their home and uh, they need uh, someone to know when they've got a problem, it's uh, sending information to another place, that's telecare. And uh, a, a much broader umbrella around that is telehealth. So that includes both telemedicine, telecare, telecare, as well as much broader ideas like doctors being able to learn things remotely, so online learning. Finally, many of us will be aware of wearables. Many of you may be wearing wearables. And the, the obvious idea there would be an activity tracker, but that's not the only wearable. So the idea is that it's transmitting health information from something that you're wearing on your body. Uh, a nice example that I found was uh, glucose monitoring, so that's something that a diabetic would wear on their skin. Uh, it would continually uh, have a look at uh, the, the skin and then uh, from that be able to determine their glucose levels and then advise them to take an appropriate intervention. Uh, fall alarms are, are another example, so uh, an, a, a person who's at risk of falling may be able to wear a pendant around their neck it's got an accelerometer in it, and then that could again uh, alert them to either the danger of falling. I saw one that actually involved airbags in a belt around the waist, so actually help with the fall or alert somebody that they needed help. So all of this is in the health space. Um, uh, the, the fifth one that I meant to mention is personalised medicine, but I'm, uh, and that's all to do with using genetic information in order to personalise treatment, but I couldn't see an obvious parallel to what we would do in disability claims, so I'm not going to go into detail on that tonight. So these are all ideas in the uh, health and care space, and they're very obvious parallels because when someone is putting in a claim for disability, uh, by definition, they have a medical problem of some kind and they will be receiving care. So what the claims manager is trying to do is work in partnership with uh, the medical professionals uh, to try and get this person back to work. So there's a slightly different focus, but you're dealing with the same person and there could then be opportunities to use similar technologies and solutions to improve outcomes for everyone. So what do we mean by improving outcomes? So there are five objectives that uh, certainly uh, one of the institutes looking at digital health identified as uh, being an objective that you want to achieve with digital health. And I've drawn out the parallels that I see with, digital, with disability claims. So we would like to increase quality of care. If you think NHS has got a strategy around this, how can you use this technology to, to improve outcomes for people? So, the parallel that I saw is improving the, the claims decisions and interventions that somebody receives. So when somebody's put in a disability claim, they want to know that they're going to be treated fairly, promptly, and they also want support from the insurer. So, so things that are perhaps not going as well as they could now, there are many good things that happen in the disability space, but there could be a bias if somebody's got a condition that's variable from day to day, and they happen to go for an assessment on a good day, and then they get the claim declined. Um, or uh, the claims manager is also looking to get the person back into work. So again, if they've got good information flow, are there opportunities that they could then uh, encourage the person to go for something that will help rehabilitate, rehabilitate them back to work? In the health and care space and in the disability claim space, everyone's looking to reduce costs. So costs come in the form of the actual claims payments as well as the cost of administering the claim. 
So uh, ways that we may uh, that where we're struggling at the moment could be uh, delays in getting a medical appointment. So with uh, resources constrained in, in the health environment, we sometimes see that somebody needs to go for a physio appointment, but they have an 18-week delay before they can get that, at which point the opportunity to rehabilitate them is much diminished. So again, is there a way that we can in interact better, use technology in order to get uh, some treatments in place. Improving access. So uh, in the healthcare space, uh, being able to get to a doctor in a convenient way is what we think about. If somebody's trying to put in a disability claim, they want to be able to do that in an easy way, be able to reach the insurer uh, and, ha and have the appropriate interactions at the right time. So an example, um, I've had personal experience in the PMI space where I was, as, as a customer, on hold for a long time trying to get an authorization in order to get, uh, get an appointment with the doctor. So when someone's health is compromised like that, is there not a better way that they can then interact with the insurer to notify them what has gone on and then get some initial indication back from the insurer about what the next steps are going to be? Reducing inefficiencies in delivery, so um, we hear many stories of why the medical system may not be operating efficiently. So when I spoke to my claims colleagues, they could have had me there for hours uh, detailing the numbers of times where they've had to do things that were not utilising their skills in rehabilitation, but was really taking up admin time and making the whole process inefficient and unpleasant for all. So a key example there is they're still using a lot of paper-based uh, communications with doctors, so papers going off in the post, it's taking a long time to get back, someone then has to manually enter it into a system, so again, it seems like there's a solution that could be found there to make the experience more efficient for all. And then finally, uh, one of the uh, objectives with digital health would be, can we make this more person-centred, can we make this a nice experience for everyone? So the examples that, that I thought of here is if you're a disability claimant and you get a phone call from your claims manager a few days before you've gone for your medical appointment asking you what happened at your medical appointment, that's not a very good intervention. Whereas if you got the call the day after with a sympathetic, oh, how did it go yesterday, that, that feels like a much more positive, person-centred approach. So coming back to the disciplines in digital health and how those relate to disability claims, uh, so a couple of examples there. So how could health information technology uh, help there? We've seen in the group space that electronic absence records made available to the group insurer made it faster for the disability claim to go through, so the insurer was alerted much earlier in the process that someone was at risk of, of needing to put in a claim. Uh, the other thing that could also help there is if there are dashboards, because this is a partnership between multiple stakeholders, so could the doctor, the insurer, the claimant, the employer all have access to a dashboard uh, underpinned by an electronic system where everybody knows what they're expected to do and what is going to happen next. So in, in terms of mobile health, well, m most people do have access to a mobile phone. Uh, by analogy, the, uh, in fact, some of the providers we're working on, they've got uh, a, a approval to be on the NHS's beta website, where there are apps available in many areas, mental health, uh, musculoskeletal areas, cancer, and could someone then uh, get access to this app on their phone and then start to get some therapy that perhaps is more difficult to arrange face to face. Uh, even something like a reminder to uh, attend an appointment or a reminder to contact the insurer as soon as an appointment has happened, again, is all enabled by mobile technology. A very nice example that we saw using mobile technology was where somebody had a fracture, they went to hospital, and then what they did is they took a photograph of their hospital discharge note as well as a photograph of the injury and they sent it to the insurer and their disability claim was admitted on the basis of that evidence. In terms of telehealth, this is all about everyone being remote, so uh, the idea here is, is there a better way that doctors, patients and insurers can all interact? Uh, using communication technology. So if you could get the uh, 
the insurer being able to talk to the doctor or the customer being able to talk to the insurer a bit more remotely, perhaps by a chatbot, that feels like a, a, a potential solution. And finally, wearables. Uh, I spoke of the example of where you get inconsistencies between somebody having a good day or a bad day, depending on their claims assessment. Uh, if somebody has got a variable condition, if they can have a piece of wearable technology that they're then willing to share with the insurer, that may lead to a much fairer assessment where the insurer can see the patterns of what is going on in their health. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Ross and he'll share a bit more on the examples as well as some of the interesting challenges that he's faced or has been thinking about in the space. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. So I've been talking to startups and investigating the potential for digital for around three years. Uh, and one of the questions, first questions people ask me uh, is which of these uh, solutions is actually being used anywhere? Um, and uh, that's always a difficult question to answer because um, very few are actually being used there, which is um, unusual really, because if I had uh, asked for a show of hands, uh, so hands up who doesn't have a mobile phone, Guaranteed, no one puts their hand up ever, but everyone has a phone and we all use apps and we're all listening to this idea about using digital solutions and how seductive it is. Why is it not actually happening? So I thought it'd be interesting to round off uh, our presentation thinking about some of the blocks, the things that get in the way. Um, for startups, I think, you know, there's just the sheer complexity of insurance uh, is, is a, uh, a, a sort of block almost. Um, I think they see it as an opportunity, they understand it's an industry that's uh, ripe for some change. I think we're, we're saying that about ourselves, so uh, that's not hard to find. Um, but it is, it's bafflingly difficult. The products we sell uh, are not familiar to, uh, to many of the people that I'm encountering, and even the languages that we use to describe the things we do are not familiar. And obviously it's a heavily regulated industry, uh, there are barriers to entry um, and there are certain things that we have to do to comply with rules and laws and these are all different in all different domains and again that's very baffling uh, to people who are encountering insurance for the first time. Generally speaking, startups are not being created by people who've left the insurance industry thinking that they might make a startup to serve the insurance industry. Um, I have found few people who've worked in insurance, but typically um, entrepreneurs are not furnished with that kind of background. So their insurance knowledge is low, um, and we have to help them understand uh, what it is we do and how they can help us. Uh, startups are obsessed with raising money. Um, they're spending their own money, their parents' money, their friends' money. They spend my money if I offered them any. Um, and they're constantly on the lookout for investment uh, and they're very uh, driven by that. So a lot of the material that they present is aimed at attracting investors and doesn't often answer the questions that we're interested in. I fully understand why they're interested in raising money because building software and testing uh, ideas is not cheap. And this is why uh, when you encounter uh, an entrepreneur who's, a, who's got a, uh, a decent idea uh, and you ask for a demo, you often see a half-finished or even not even half-finished product. Uh, they only build what's minimally viable to kind of demonstrate uh, what their technology idea uh, is. Uh, and so it's impractical for us to expect that we're going to be able to buy these things off the shelf and plug them into systems without any uh, customization, without any work. Um, and again, that's uh, uh, something we have to get used to. Um, normally, if we buy a product, it's ready. Um, and they're also very easily distracted by other shiny things. They work in a different, a different environment to us. You know, people go through a three-month incubation process. They've spent all their money, and angel investor gives them more. And then they encounter insurance, which hasn't changed for 300 years, has a special momentum all of its own. Um, so there's some issues on there. So the, on, on the insurance and reinsurance side, well, I think the most obvious one is, well, which of these companies do you choose to work with? Um, because there's so many of them. More than 550,000 uh, startups were launched 
each month on average last year. Uh, and 30,000 of those identified themselves as insurtech companies. So where do you begin? Then we're concerned about the sustainability. First of all, they're all exploiting the available technology. So we're talking about wearables, we're talking about the digital data on phones that look like this, that are unlikely to look like this in future. Uh, do we want to hitch ourselves to a technology that might change? Are we having a Betamax moment? Uh, and, and again, we need to think about that. You know, there will be a seamless development of apps and software and hardware, we'll go with it. But it's a concern. And we're also worried about scalability. You know, uh, I meet a company that's really got very little money, it's got very few staff, it's actually not got any customers, uh, and we're going to plug them right into our important insurance business that's uh, long-term uh, guarantees of uh, managing uh, risk. And again, that's something we have to kind of, uh, uh, well, we have to approach and uh, rationalize ourselves. Then there's just the technical validation of the ideas. Do they work? What about these algorithms that they say they have, they're proprietary, they don't want to give too much away, and yet we want to understand how they work. Um, and then we've got to decide whether we're integrating these ideas to make our current processes better or more user-friendly or simpler or whatever it is, um, or whether we're going to eliminate all those processes and just go completely digital. So we're intrigued by this. There's a fear of missing out. There's lots of interest, and that's really good because uh, you know we're getting some dialogue uh, and some momentum behind uh, this whole idea. But the more powerful force is a fear of a better offer. So FOBO takes over, and no one really wants to commit. And I think we're all concerned about the data. You know, what is the data? Do we need it all? Is it just nice to have? How do we look after it? Will people share it with us? Can we use it sensibly? Um, and so those are all concerns. So the second things I wanted to talk about were the things that are on offer is give some ideas uh, of, of some of the solutions that are out there. We're interested in um, therapeutic apps, things that are built along clinical pathways. So uh, for example, Thrive is a mental health app uh, that in, embodies nice guidelines. It has diagnostic criteria that we understand. It's not something that somebody's made up or thought about uh, in, the, in their shed. Uh, Montenso is another example of that. We're interested in things that work. Uh, so prescription exercise apps that can get people moving again quickly. People can personalize these, uh, get involved in video-based exercises to rebuild their physical strength. Uh, Track Active is one example of that. Uh, Injury Map is another. And we're also interested in those uh, companies that are exploiting the technology still further, the uh, 3D cameras that will soon be in our phones, for example. So uh, using that to, um, to analyze motion, to see what's, uh, to match with normal movement, to see where people's uh, limitations are occurring. It could be used at an underwriting stage or at a claim stage. And AMO is a company that's involved in, uh, in that kind of technology. And it's, it's, it's slightly ahead of the curve, waiting for the technology to catch up with it. So for the consumer, I think there are numbers of things that are interesting. Uh, these ideas are convenient and easy to use. Um, people want to be involved in uh, quantified self. They want to get cracking. They don't want to wait six months for an appointment to see uh, someone in health services when they can download an app and get on with it. Uh, they want things that are personalized to them. So if the app doesn't work for them or an exercise, for example, that's prescribed actually hurts and isn't helping them get better, they can feed that back in and it can change almost immediately. For insurers, I think it's all about the data. Um, we don't know how much the data is useful, but we know we want it. Um, we're not sure how we're going to use it, but we're definitely going to use it for something. Um, but seriously, the data is very different to the data that dwells in claims files. Disability claims files are beautifully manicured, tend to be very analog, uh, and they're hard to extract meaningful uh, insights from. Uh, so we also hope that we'll lead to some savings. So savings could be in the processes. Uh, the cost of, uh, of the analysis and management of disability claims. Savings could be that uh, we allow customers access to uh, an app before they claim uh, to help them build resilience, uh, to avoid that injury, to um, prevent the, the inevitable happening, if you like. Um, and 
I guess we hope that we'll improve our experience over time, uh, that uh, we can reflect that in our pricing perhaps, or certainly the experience that our customers uh, feed back about us uh, is, is perhaps more uniform. People only really appreciate insurance when they make a disability claim, and then they think it's fabulous. Um, but very few people actually encounter us in that way. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, I suppose, anti-news, if you like, or fake news even, uh, about what insurance does and doesn't do, um, which is slightly irking for us, who uh, we know that it does provide very strong benefits for people. And finally, uh, what to do? Well, the things to do are really uh, relatively simple. Five things. First of all, engage with it. So meet startups or people who are meeting startups. Uh, think about how these ideas might work for you. And my role in, in this for Genry is to join the dots from the entrepreneurs of the land they live in, uh, the speeds they go at, uh, joining those dots through into a slower pace, uh, a more settled environment, if you like and joining those dots into our clients and then ultimately to the customers of our clients. Uh, and our mantra is to collaborate. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs work in shared working spaces that collaborate just as a way of life. Uh, they're all making discrete solutions <coughs> and they're not concerned about uh, not collaborating. Sometimes they want to join up to create a better solution. And then you need to get into doing some project work, so some pilots, actually get involved uh, and ultimately to implement uh, some of these solutions initially perhaps in a parallel environment, perhaps with a test group. Um, but it's really a very simple pathway. So that's uh, everything I had to say uh, about the um, implementation and I've given you some examples. Clearly there's loads of examples. As you uh, heard from me, there's hundreds of these companies out there. Um, so that concludes our presentation. Um, so on behalf of Adele and myself, I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Uh, yeah, th thanks Ross and Adele. Um, th this, it's your uh, opportunity to ask questions now, so we've got 10 minutes. So, um, so is anybody, there's, the, there's a roving mic at the back of the room, so, so please put up your hand if you've got a, a question. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Go to Gar. Yes. I've, um, uh, so, is, so, is this the idea to to to, to do for um, for the human population what's being done for automobiles? Like, where, where you have you have uh, um, um, various types of monitoring instrumentation inside your car, and uh, um, essentially the, the insurer can can check exactly how you're driving, whether erratically or whatever. So, so in particular. Um, uh, uh, is the idea that to check on whether you've done your 10 minutes of brisk walking every day, I mean, that kind of, kind of thing. And, and, uh, and also, it, there's a question in my mind about how intrusive this might be. I mean, it, that, that essentially, because it's, it's one thing to, to have uh, somebody checking on exactly how you're driving, that's sort of fair enough, but, but uh, someone, have someone checking on when you're going to the gym or not. <laughs> I mean, something so, have you thought about this? It's... I mean, just in terms of uh, disability claims, scenario. I mean, if I was claiming and I wanted to get back to work, I suppose I'd be keen to, uh, to engage in a modern way. Um, the NHS is providing apps. Why don't insurers provide them? Uh, why do I have to wait six weeks to see the consultant uh, about my bad back when I could download an app and begin some exercises now that might help? Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, it's slightly untested whether people will or will not share data uh, in that way. Um, uh, and I suppose we are willingly sharing data in lots of other ways. Um, we've all shared data just by having a phone in our pocket. Um, it's giving off thousands of data points about where you are and where you've been and what you do and what apps you've had and how many calls you've done, whether you want to or not. So the only way to not have it is to, to disconnect from the digital world and I can't believe there are many people who are willing to do that. Hi, um, I was just thinking, with, um, with income protection, there are, with certain providers, there are clauses that uh, are there to help people
get better. So for example, um, there are clause, in some policy providers, they will pay for treatment like um, physiotherapy or even getting a cab to work if you, if you can't get to work. Do you feel as though um, people, customers are aware of how insurers can, uh, can, can help them? And, and do you think the way that life insurance of income protection is sold kind of means that people aren't aware of these things? I think a lot of the marketing around disability insurance is around the money, but I think the real value comes in those added services. So someone who's actually helping you through the process, guiding you through some ideas of, of how to work with an injury or, or a type of disability. I've seen an example from uh, New Zealand where they didn't market it as a disability insurance product, but more a rehabilitation benefit. So I think once somebody gets to claim stage and they've had a positive experience and there's, there's a good reciprocal relationship with the insurer, I think that's the point at which they value it. I think the low disability or income protection sales already tell us how much people value it at new business stage. Uh, Ian, just with... Thank you, my name is Ian Collier. Um, I'm interested particularly uh, the interaction between the insurers, well it, it, it could be the NHS, but it, the insurers in particular, with the um, start-up high-tech companies. And there are a lot of very clever um, people looking for start-ups out there, but don't even know where to start because they don't know what the problems are. Um, and uh, Ross, you suggested that um, you need to help them, but do insurers or do other people perhaps go to the startup hubs around the world, whether it's in this country, in the United States, maybe Israel, anywhere, where there are a lot of bright young people looking for startups, looking for high tech, uh, but don't really know where to go or where to start? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think typically within. Uh, incubators and, and um, boot camp type uh, organizations that insurers are encouraged to invest their time and money. Um, I mean the motivation might be that they're looking for the next best thing um, or the motivation might be altruistic. They want to create something that's useful for, for everyone, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I think reinsurers have a really important role to play uh, in, in selecting some of the better and more promising from the thousands of available startups. Um, often I find companies select us. Um, I think they know that, that we might be quite challenging. Um, and typically, we see quite good quality um, uh, thinking. Uh, and we have a checklist of things we look for in startups that help us. Um, but I think it's unrealistic. I think I said in, in my presentation part, it's unrealistic to expect a 20-year-old person who's a whiz kid with data to come up with a solution that fits with my problem on income protection claims unless I speak to them about it. So, so I li I'd like to think there is enough dialogue, um, but you know, out of all of the thousands of these companies, so few of them actually make enough money to, to, to make it through, um, which may also explain the comments I made at the very beginning, which is, you know, where are all the examples of this being used in your market, which I'm asked on a virtually daily basis. Um, eventually it will happen, um, but I think it will happen through collaboration, and I think insurers and reinsurers need to engage with it. Uh, two questions. Thank you. Um, David Murray, um, perhaps a comment and a question. Um, comment just to add to um, response to Ian's last question. <clears throat> so um, I, I work for Bupa, um, and we actually bring st startups into the organization um, as a, well, it's becoming an annual exercise. So we'll pose a number of uh, business questions and invite startups to apply to spend three months with us. So leveraging the resources within the firm um, and bringing in sort of fresh young talent to sort of work in an innovative way on, on these ideas. So I think that, you know, that's just an example of how um, insurers can practically in interact. Um, my question, um, so we know that a couple of the key determinants of 
recovery from disability are firstly the underlying motivation of the individual claimant to recover and get back to work um, and secondly early intervention on the part of the insurers. I'm, I was wondering whether you've come across any examples of the use of technology to make that assessment of motivation perhaps to engage in a motivational way with the claimants and therefore to help an insurer to direct its activity to the, the claims that are most likely to be amenable to intervention? Uh, yeah, good question. And, and uh, yes, I, absolutely, you're, you're right. Lots of companies are uh, taking uh, com uh, entrepreneurs under their wing and, and putting them through their own uh, incubation processes, which is, which is, uh, which is useful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think in, in context of, of disability claims, I think it's un, untested um, to answer your question directly. Where I look for evidence is where uh, these things are working in the clinical world. Uh, so one of the key uh, issues around that is, is there evidence that this actually works? Does it, does it help people get better? Uh, and the second is, do people continue to engage with it? Um, and uh, you know, where, where engagement is high and, and um, success in treatment is high, then I'm encouraged that uh, the question you're asking would be answered. Um, at the moment, I'm not sure there's enough uh, to show that it works in an insurance setting. Uh, and there is obviously this concern that you know, insurers are not trusted in the same way that perhaps uh, other services are, and, and we have to address that in some way. Um, and, and show that we can actually help people um, and use the data that they're prepared to share with us uh, in a constructive way to help them get better more, more, more quickly. Um, but until, until we can actually show that, then you have to fall back on the published evidence uh, or, or the clinical uh, outcomes that, uh, that, that these companies are already delivering in their other business, if you like. Um, so a lot of them are involved in, in delivering clinical uh, solutions to, to patients. And we're talking about delivering semi-clinical solutions to claimants, so we're not that far apart, um, but, but the motivations of those two population groups are quite distinct. Yeah, and, and if I just add, I haven't seen a, a tool that assesses motivation. It's at the moment very much more down to the claims manager who then tries to use perhaps some behavioural economics techniques to try and generate a bit of reciprocity or or something positive, something positive. But yeah, if, if we could find an app, um, it'd be great to collaborate on it. <laughs> I think just I would add, um, there is something uh, in, the, in the feedback, so there's some point around behavioral stuff, that if the instant feedback you can, you can drive through a, a digital uh, solution. Um, you know, someone in a claim setting is going to be seen episodically. Uh, whereas they're going to see the app every day if they choose to, or they might say, well, I only want you to talk to me every week or something. You know, they, they can manage that and they can get rewards or feedback or encouragement or whatever it is they need, a different plan uh, or, or, or whatever. Um, and, and that's something that the traditional way of, of, of looking after disability claims can't, can't really offer. We can't see people on a daily basis, even if we'd like to. I think there's a question up on the left hand side. Oh yeah. Uh, Sean McCarthy is my name. Um, just some of the focus seems to be on claim management. And I'm just wondering, is there, has there been any inroads made with kind of the mitigation of disability claims arriving in the first place? So, I don't know, uh, managed life uh, product that's actually selling. Um, has there been much kind of uh, collaboration with startups on that end of it? Um, I think there's, a, there's definitely a role for, for resilience building in, uh, in uh, policyholders, um, whether their motivation, the, the previous question was asking about motivation, whether the motivation is there to engage with your insurer on a daily basis when you don't really need them, I don't know. Um, but, you know, some of the therapeutic apps are about keeping you well, and uh, they're not all, only designed for people who are unwell. Um, so I, I completely agree there's an opportunity there 
um, to build a model that, 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 that facilitates that. Um, and whether that's a range of different apps that people say, well, you know, my back's hurting today, does my insurer have something that could help? Or is there some other way I could monitor that and help myself get better that I could then show the insurer for some reward? Why not? I mean, it's all, it's all for grabs, I think, you know, it's just, it's just a changed way of thinking. Yeah, I think uh, thanks very much for the questions and answers, and thanks very much to Ross and Adele for the, the talk. And that's it, was great. Um, just moving on to, uh, to the next speaker. Um, it's uh, Gordon. Sorry, I've got to change my glasses. Can't read. <laughs> it's uh, Dr. Gordon Wu is uh, chief architect for of the RMS life risk pandemic model which was developed in 2005 at the time of the emergence of, the lethal, of a lethal strain of avian flu. Amongst his articles on pandemic risk is a contribution to the pandemics edition of the 2015 IFOA Longevity Bulletin. Educated at Cambridge, MIT and Harvard, he is a visiting professor of UCL and an adjunct professor of Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. He is an author of two books on catastrophe risks published by Imperial College Press. Okay, thanks very much, Scott. The last talk was about big data. My talk is about one small piece of information which everybody here needs to have or find out. And my talk is important not just for your professional work as an actuary or underwriter, but it's important for you as a person, for your families, for your friends, your colleagues. It's 100 years since the great 1918 pandemic. But quite remarkably, it is only in the last two years that a true understanding of the age dependence of that pandemic has been revealed through diligent science. And that's what I'm going to tell you about uh, today. Just um, so you don't know, die of the tension of, of uh, wanting to find out what one piece of information is that you need to know. It is the first strain of flu to which you were exposed as a child. You need to know this. The first strain of flu to which you were exposed as a child. So when you get home, you can call your mums or your grandmother or whatever, try to find out what was the first flu to which you were exposed as a child. Like Scott told me he was born in 1969. Most uh, likely, he was exposed uh, to the Hong Kong pandemic of 1968, but more of that uh, later. At the start of this year, uh, I was uh, thinking about um, the uh, centennial of the 1918 uh, pandemic. And um, uh, uh, normally with um, anniversaries, um, the, the general uh, way of thinking is to say, well, supposing that pandemic were to occur this year, Okay, supposing the 1918 pandemic were to occur in 2018. Uh, but I thought in a different way. Um, just last year, I, I wrote this report uh, for Lloyd's called uh, Counterfactual Risk Analysis, uh, Reimagining History. It came out in October of uh, last year with, a, uh, with publicity in The Economist uh, magazine. So my alternative way of looking at the 1918 pandemic was this. How could the 1918 pandemic have been different from what it really was? And you can say, well, who cares? We know what the 1918 pandemic was. So let's move on. Let's think about 20th. No. How could the 1918 pandemic have been different? And the answer to that question is, it could have been different if the previous pandemic in 1890 had occurred a bit earlier or a bit later. And that was really the start of uh, this journey into exploring um, the uh, age dependence of the 1918 but, um, but let me start with some basic virology. The, the two main players in this, this cast of, of thousands are, uh, are the two proteins, neuraminidase and hemagglutinin. Neuraminidase is the protein um, which uh, uh, sort of attaches to, to, to your, your, your throat or, or your chest. Um, and uh, hemagglutinin uh, is what uh, sort of governs the release of uh, the virus uh, from the host uh, uh, cell. So remember, these, these are the two key pr proteins, neuraminidase, with the capital N, hemagglutinin, and the capital H. Um, the the uh, five most recent pandemics are listed here. 
Uh, now, uh, most likely, uh, in your recollection of pandemics, uh, you only knew uh, essentially uh, possibly the days and the name of the flu, like Spanish flu, Asian flu, Hong Kong flu, Mexican flu, whatever, and you probably didn't take, pay too much attention to what strain it was. Like, I mean, who cares? It was, it was just a pandemic. Well, in fact, the strain turns out to be really crucial. Um, so we had H3N8 in, in 18, 89, 1890, um, um, uh, H1N1 in, in, in the great pandemic, H2N2, the Asian flu, uh, H3N2, the Hong Kong flu, and, and mo most recently, H1N1, uh, the Mexican flu. <coughs> um, but before I get on to talking about um, how lethal viruses are, I'd just like to say a few words about the contagion. Um, the, the, con the degree to which a virus is contagious depends partly on the characteristics of the virus itself, because the, the virus can, can sort, of, uh, sort of attach to the throat or, contact or, or deeper in, in, in the chest and so on. Uh, and what's crucial is um, the, uh, um, the way in which um, the virus causes you to either cough or sneeze. So uh, if uh, it attaches to your throat, then you might be, be coughing more uh, uh, and so on, and so you might be able to spread the, the virus more easily to people around you. But that's not all that matters in contagion. What also matters is, is your social network. Uh, who is it that around, uh, around you that you can spread the contagion to? And that's really crucial in terms of um, trying to figure out what the uh, overall uh, spread of the uh, virus will be. Um, so I'd like to say a few words about um, the 1918 pandemic in terms of its contagion. I think most people know that um, it killed more people than fought in the Great War. Uh, itself, and it's a picture taken from a, uh, an American uh, camp in uh, Kansas. Um, what most people here would not know is that uh, um, there was a Chinese connection uh, to this, namely uh, that um, the Chinese government of the day sent 95,000 labourers to the Western Front to do menial jobs in the Western Front, like cooking, um, digging trenches, uh, laundries, and so on. Um, and um, they brought the, uh, um, the contagion with them from China uh, uh, through across uh, um, to, uh, uh, to Vancouver and then by, by rail across Canada to uh, Nova Scotia and then by, by boat to, to Britain and Europe. Um, and um, um, just for historical interest, the, the reason why the Chinese government decided to do this is because um, they wanted to try to get uh, Shandong province back uh, from the Japanese who were uh, uh, occupying it at the time. Okay, that's just by way of explaining that just how contagious the the 1918 pandemic was, that basically when, when you have large fluxes of population, such as the 95,000 Chinese Labour Corps, that's dangerous. Uh, so in our own time in 2015, when we had a million refugees uh, from Syria going to Germany, um, that was also a very dangerous situation. Fortunately, there was no uh, pandemic outbreak in 2015, otherwise that would have been a real uh, uh, nightmare. And of course, if you think of the Ebola outbreak um, in 2000 and. Uh, uh, and 14, then, then also if there'd been a civil war in um, West Africa at the time, that would have been a very dangerous uh, situation for the whole world. Um, just in terms of the lethality uh, characteristics of uh, an influenza virus, a lot of attention has been given to thinking about what kinds of, of aspects of a, the virus itself might be contributing to uh, its lethality. Uh, but actually there's an easier answer to this question of the, of how lethal viruses are, which I shall explain to you. First of all, um, with reference to the uh, traditional way of looking at uh, the 1918 pandemic, uh, we had uh, a lot of attention given to so-called cytokines. These cytokines um, um, are proteins that govern uh, uh, and regulate the immune and infl inflammatory uh, response of a person. Uh, and so this phrase, the cytokine storm, was coined, in fact, at the same time as the, um, the desert storm in the, the first Iraq war, that's how this term came about, the so-called cytokine storm, which was an overreaction of the immune system uh, to um, attack uh, by uh, uh, an external uh, virus. And it always has been thought that um, the age profile um, of the victims of the 1918 pandemic was essentially explainable uh, by the cytokine storm. Okay, now, on this uh, diagram shown, on uh, uh, the bottom there, um, the level of the immune system, and it's pretty much flat um, once you get um, uh, past uh, infancy and before you get into old age, the, uh, the level of uh, the immune system is pretty much uh, flat. Um, and uh, this flatness does not explain the following data. 
which is the age profile uh, of um, uh, victims uh, in Canada, we've got Montreal and Toronto, which has a, a spike at age 28. And if we, that, that, this is Canada. If we look at um, um, uh, New York City, which is also uh, good data, we also see the spike at about age 28. Now, uh, everyone here can subtract 28 from 1918, and you get 1890. Now, what, and of course, 1890 was the date of the last uh, pandemic. And um, um, the most famous 28-year-old uh, who died in the 1918 pandemic was arguably um, the great Viennese expressionist artist Egon Schiele. And if you were to visit uh, Vienna uh, this year, you'd see a wonderful exhibition, retrospective uh, of uh, the work of Egon Schiele, who tragically died at such a young age uh, uh, during the 1918 uh, uh, pandemic. Now, um, I'd just like to, to, to uh, say, say some words about um, um, exposure to H3N8, which was the Russian uh, flu. Um, crucially, um, those who were exposed um, to um, the, um, the, the Russian flu, essentially people like um, uh, Egon Schiele, for example, that they were uh, in trouble when the, um, the 1918 pandemic came about because it was of a, a different uh, group of viruses. I'll, 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 I'll describe the different groups uh, in, a, in a moment, but crucially, um, those who uh, were um, unfortunate enough to have been born around 1890 uh, and caught the Russian flu um, that um, come uh, 1918, um, they uh, were uh, very vulnerable to, um, to that virus. So this is the basic arithmetic uh, of the pandemic. Um, the Russian flu occurred in 18, uh, 1890. Um, um, and uh, this leads to a, a new concept, I'm sure, to, to most of you, which is that of antigenic uh, seniority. Um, uh, uh, and basically, the, the whole concept of antigenic uh, seniority um, is that um, the strongest response uh, of your immune system to any type of flu is to that specific um, strain of flu to which you were first exposed as a child. Okay, and, and this is a, a, uh, a discovery which has uh, just been reinforced by uh, recent uh, data and observations. Um, and, um, but the actual concept of it goes back uh, to um, this uh, Welsh-American, Thomas Francis, um, who came up with this idea, uh, which uh, was first called original antigenic sin, uh, for those uh, who uh, know something about um, the uh, religious fervor of the Welsh Valleys. Uh, this is uh, how it originated, that uh, I think Thomas Francis's father was a, uh, was a Methodist minister, I think, uh, and, and so I think he must have been brought, brought up on, on um, on, on the whole concept of original sin. And so here we have original antigenic sin, which is that the, 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 um, the, the virus to which you were first exposed is uh, what you are most uh, vulnerable uh, to. Um, and it's taken a long time for these ideas of Thomas Francis uh, to be um, validated uh, by uh, real data uh, in terms of experience in subsequent uh, influenza outbreaks. Um, now, another bit of uh, virology, which uh, I have to impose on you, uh, is um, to uh, explain to you that there are two phylogenetic groups of influenza. Uh, there are basically two groups, uh, and that they essentially they, these these two groups uh, um, uh, essentially uh, uh, um, encompass the range of of types of uh, hemagglutinin uh, variations uh, of flu. Uh, but crucially, um, if you happen to um, have been exposed uh, in childhood to um, a strain of flu in one of the groups, then you're pretty much covered uh, if uh, a strain of flu in the same group occurs. So if you look at this diagram here, take, if you take group one, um, that if you were exposed a child to say H1, um, then if H2 turns up or um, H6, then you're pretty much covered. And similarly, if you expose a child to H3, um, then if H7 turns up, then you'd be because, and this, um, this grouping of strains of flu uh, goes by the name antigenic imprinting. I'm sorry to give you all this, this, new, new, all this new terminology uh, on, on, a sort of, uh, uh, on a Monday afternoon, but, but, um, the, but this is, this, it's important uh, to know this. So, the, so the, um, the whole principle of antigenic imprinting is that your immune system is imprinted with 
the uh, response to the first flu to which you were exposed. You can't do anything about it. It's part of, it's part of you now. It's a permanent, it's, it's, it's like being branded. You know, the first flu to which you're exposed leaves a permanent imprint on you. It, it's part of you. That's why, um, um, in terms of, uh, of insurance, um, uh, it's not just a question of how old you are in terms of your vulnerability, it's your date of birth which is crucial. Because your date of birth tells you a lot about what first flu you would have been exposed to. So that's why with, with our chairman here, Scott, that um, he, he's a marked man. 1969, he was born in 1969, just after the 1968 Hong Kong flu. Now what does this tell you? What it tells you um, is that um, most likely, and I think he's, he's now seriously considering having a serological test to try to check out exactly what first what uh, antibodies he has as a different types uh, of flu. But, but, but what this means is, if the next pandemic happens to be like 1918, H1N1, then um, my advice to our chairman is to get vaccinated. Don't leave it to chance. Okay. However, um, if the, um, the next pandemic happens to be H3N1, then he's okay. Um, uh, so, so this is the, the principle of antigenic um, imprinting. And this is the key slide here in the whole presentation. And this slide uh, comes from a paper published in the premier scientific journal Science, that's American Journal Science, and is op uh, only published two years ago, October 2016, this, this, this great paper was published. And it has this wonderful title, First Flu is Forever. First Flu is Forever. Love. Can, can, can come and go, but flu cannot. First flu is forever. Diamonds are forever, maybe not. But first flu is forever. First flu is forever. And, and this is a wonderful diagram here. And you can just leave an imprint of this on, on your uh, memories. Okay, okay. And the reason why this new science has taken so long um, to, uh, to surface uh, and to be, um, uh, uh, to be validated is because it has taken time to gather the data for two major flu uh, outbreaks of the past several decades. We have um, H5N1, we had the, the, this was the, the bird flu, which started in about 2004, 2005. And in the case of the bird flu, um, uh, the age profile of the victims was very much um, young uh, and middle-aged. So the, the watershed is 1968. So I think Scott here is paying special attention to this. So, so, the, so the watershed is 1960, well, some of you too who might be of a similar age. So is basically, those who were, who were born afterwards, um, that, that they were um, uh, uh, most likely um, first exposed to, to um, the other uh, group, group two. And so most of the victims were uh, in that uh, age group of young to middle age. However, if you take uh, age 709, which was another um, uh, highly lethal uh, uh, strain of flu, where the lethality rate was something like one third, one third of all those who caught age 709 died from it. The age profile for this flu uh, was, was very different. It was the older people who mainly died. I think lots of the victims were in China. And, and so instead of the kind of pattern we might have expected, where if you have some serious flu, it's going to be young and middle-aged people who will be dying. In the case of age 709, it was the older people who died. And that is because um, they were, their, the first flu to which they were exposed was um, uh, essentially H1 of, of the type H1N1. And, and so when uh, H7 and 9 uh, turned up, which is group 2, um, um, they were in a bad uh, situation. And so, so essentially, um, they, um, I, I lost, uh, they were very vulnerable. And you can, just with the basic information I'm giving you, you can work out a lot of... Uh, things about past experience of mortality and morbidity in flu, um, just from reading that paper. Uh, and, um, uh, um, um, and an awful lot can be explained uh, in, in terms uh, of that. If you just take um, the cohort born between 1880 and, uh, and, um, and uh, 1900, um, um, what has been found is that this cohort was, was strongly impacted by the um, 1957 pandemic, uh, because that was H2N2, which was the same grouping uh, as um, in 1918. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, but interestingly, uh, when um, the H3N2 Hong Kong flu turned up in 1968, 
um, they did okay, uh, simply because um, they had been uh, first exposed to H3N8 from the Russian flu. So when H3N2 turned up, um, they were doing okay. And uh, if you, now if you consider um, the mortality of the Hong Kong flu in 1968, what we find is that the peak is actually of those born around the time of the, first, of the Great Pandemic of 1918, that those who were born around then were first exposed to H1N1. And so when, H, when um, this pandemic occurred of, a, of the other group, group two, uh, they were in trouble. Um, now, what I said uh, applies not just to influenza pandemics, but also to seasonal flu. So if you think, well, you don't have to, the basic one I'm talking about is only of, of, uh, of relevance uh, every 20, 30 years when, when a pandemic has gone, that, that's not correct because it tells you a lot about the mortality and seasonal flu. So if you take the 2013-2014 um, um, flu season, which is predominantly um, uh, H1N1, uh, uh, um, uh, um, um, there was severe illness amongst young and middle-aged adults, um, but older people were not really badly um, um, affected. And so um, the excess deaths uh, uh, was actually quite low in 2013, 2014. However, um, if we just move on to the following year, 2014, 2015, um, when H3N2 was the uh, predominant uh, flu uh, virus, uh, we have a different uh, situation. In fact, the, the, the excess number of people died was of the order of 28,000, which was obviously a huge number of people. Um, and, um, and, and, and this was um, because of the, uh, the, the different uh, um, age uh, vulnerability um, um, uh, of H, uh, H3N2. Uh, uh, and in fact, if we look at the chart of excess winter deaths, uh, we see the spike at, in 2014, 2015. So this whole new science can actually explain um, variations in excess deaths from one year to another. Um, uh, so I was doing this kind of work in the early part of this year when Aussie flu uh, was um, uh, causing problems um, in, um, in, in the, um, um, uh, both in Europe and in, in, in North America. And of course the Aussie flu was H3N2. Uh, and uh, it was tragic to see um, young children uh, um, pre-teens, um, some of them dying from Aussie flu, because almost certainly they were first exposed to the other group of flu uh, in 2009, um, the uh, H1N1 um, uh, Mexican pandemic. So if someone who was exposed to the Mexican uh, pandemic, H1N1, um, then uh, they, they would uh, uh, be only sort of eight or nine years old now, uh, and they were actually more vulnerable uh, in, uh, this year to the, the, the seasonal flu. So. Um, so this whole principle um, that um, the first flu to which you're exposed um, is forever and, and it governs your vulnerability uh, to flu is something which everyone uh, can take home with them. Uh, and, uh, and if you're able to try, try to track uh, what flu you might have been exposed to uh, as a child, then that'd be a good thing to do and to keep in your diary and tell your GP about it. Um, uh, but uh, again, I, I'd just like to... to to emphasize uh, this remarkable fact um, that what I've been telling you today, um, I could not have, 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 um, uh, uh, have said two years ago, because this paper was only published in October 2016, this paper, First Flu is Forever, which was published uh, in 2016. I think this is a wonderful thing about science, that you wait 100 years to try to understand something, and, and basically after year 98, then you're getting close to understanding what, what happened in 19... Uh, 18. So, um, so in terms of conclusions of, of my talk, um, um, uh, if the next uh, pandemic turns, turns out to be um, Group uh, One, um, then um, uh, um, um, then the old, for the older cohort uh, of uh, uh, insureds, um, th um, the the life insurance uh, implications uh, uh, of this kind of uh, um, uh, pandemic are uh, potentially uh, significant. Um, and if you take a group uh, two pan pandemic, which could be type H through uh, N2, um, um, then we have a situation that uh, if people are, uh, were born before um, uh, 1968, then it's those people uh, who would be uh, especially vulnerable. Uh, and so this might have implications, for example, to uh, long-term care in insurance. Um, so for the very first time, it's possible uh, to have a good idea of the age profile uh, of the victims of a future pandemic 
um, just from um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, information about the type of, um, or the group of flu uh, which uh, is coming around. So, and this is, this is uh, um, for, for the very first time. So in particular, if you were to go to your GP, uh, uh, and uh, it's like with the Aussie flu of, uh, uh, of, of this past uh, winter, that um, almost certainly the GP would not be offering you any special information um, just because you were born before or after 1968. Okay, that's because what I'm telling you about is actually very new, new science. But it's something that, that, that uh, you know now, so you can actually um, um, quiz your GP about uh, uh, antigenic imprinting uh, and, and uh, antigenic seniority, and uh, hopefully won't be too uh, bemused uh, by that. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there, and I'll be uh, very happy to uh, answer questions. Um. Thanks. Thanks. But, uh, is this working? Uh, th th thanks very much, Gordon. Um, so it's, uh, it's, the floor is open for, quest for questions and answers now uh, to Gordon. Is SMD to go going first? Wali uh, Chishti. Thank you. That was a really fascinating talk. And um, it feels like we've uh, found a piece of the puzzle that explains what we saw in the 1918 pandemic, where younger people were particularly exposed to, particularly 28-year-olds. Um, I wonder if similar science could be applied to um, other kind of population cohort effects that we've seen in, in the insurance industry. Uh, for example, I think in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a cohort of pensioners who seemed to have particularly good mortality improvement experience. I wonder if there could be something maybe that they were exposed to when they were younger, which built their immune system, which meant that they were healthier or something. Do you know of any, any research or science in, into other kind of... Well, no, that's an excellent question, which is essentially to, um, to have more focus uh, on the, um, um, the vulnerability of, of cohorts of the population, uh, and uh, in particular, um, to ask questions about uh, what special immunity that, that they might have just from their uh, exposure to different types of diseases. And, uh, and of course, um, if you take the, the, the so-called cohort effect in longevity, then, then um, uh, um, uh, it has been uh, speculated that uh, um, those who might have been sort of born uh, uh, sort of before the war or so uh, might have uh, had some um, to increased immunity just from um, the, the circumstances under which uh, um, they were uh, uh, growing up at the time, so, so it's, you know, it's just a very good question, I, and I should say that the very fact that what I'm uh, explaining to you is just so recent uh, does, does uh, provide uh, food for thought in terms of uh, expanding uh, horizons in, in terms of understanding uh, vulnerability. But I should say that, that uh, the, the key thing about what I've been explaining to you is, is, is that it's all been data driven by um, the, the, the analysis of these uh, two uh, major flu outbreaks of H5N1 uh, and H7N9, uh, which had very high lethality rates. And, and so essentially, it's by um, diligent collection of the data on the mortality of, uh, of these populations that, that uh, the conclusions which I've been outlining uh, to you have uh, been obtained. But that's a, well, it's a very good, good question. And I, and I think this just understanding um, the uh, variability of uh, immunity uh, from one cohort to another is something that uh, no, I think that there will be uh, fresh uh, um, studies done to try to understand uh, them better. I've got sort of three linked questions. The first one is. Um, why do the children not die from the first um, flu that they actually um, get exposed to? Secondly, would it be possible to um, expose children to both strands of flu very early on in a safe way to give them immunity? And thirdly, could we all save our money or our NHS money and just immunise the people to the, the other group of flu that they have not been exposed to? Oh, well, of course, there's one. Uh, very uh, sensible uh, questions. But to answer your last question first, yes, I mean, the holy grail uh, of um, uh, uh, influenza virology is, of course, um, to create the universal flu vaccine, which would be good for any type of flu. Uh, and in fact, um, the kind of learning which I've outlined uh, to you uh, this afternoon is precisely the kind of understanding 
We just need it to develop a universal vaccine to understand uh, the way that people uh, respond to, to vaccines better. Uh, the, the, the current situation is that it seems like um, uh, exposure to a vaccine is not the same thing as exposure to, the real, to a real uh, flu. So, so if, you, if you're vaccinated against um, a particular strain of flu, um, that doesn't uh, have the same impact as actually catching it directly. So th there's a, a real difference between being vaccinated for something and actually uh, uh, catching it. So it's, 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 it's something which is being uh, researched uh, uh, all, all the time, but um, it, it does seem as though if you actually catch a certain strain of flu, uh, say at a young age, I think uh, um, uh, half of children catch flu by the age of two. I think that's the kind of statistic. So, so, so uh, uh, if you do catch certain type of flu, then essentially um, you're stuck with it uh, for life. In, in terms of your first question about why don't children die from it, because children are very tough, and so, and so they, 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 they cope with all kinds of diseases at uh, um, a very uh, a young age. And, and uh, um, uh, yeah, so the, the, I think the mortality rate amongst uh, children, well, of course, is still uh, uh, quite high, but it's, uh, um, it's, it's, uh, it's not uh, extraordinarily high. Hi, uh, Chen Zhen, citizen. That was a very um, interesting talk. I was just wondering, um, is there a relationship between, because you said there was a 28-year gap between the Russian flu and the Spanish flu, and, and that was the spike. Is there a relationship between the severity of your first flu? So if you catch just a normal seasonal flu, um, uh, well, uh, well, in the case of the Russian flu, is it because they caught a very severe flu that in, 19, in, in 1918 the effect was worse, but and if they had caught like... Well, in severe. fact, it, it, is the, it, it doesn't have to be a pandemic flu. So, so um, um, in the years after um, 1890, then people, the, 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 the dominant circulating strain after 1890 would have been um, the, uh, the group 2 type virus. So, like, so if you were born, for example, uh, say in uh, uh, 1895, then uh, most likely the first flu to which you were exposed was the, um, the, uh, um, the, the uh, uh, Russian uh, flu. But we get this spike at age uh, 28 um, simply uh, um, because um, you've got this um, particular cohort of people who, of, of, who, who got the, the flu, um, the, the pandemic flu, take. Um, say in 1890, 1891, and uh, um, um, but essentially they, they would have been imprinted uh, with this, and uh, um, so uh, uh, when when the other kind of type of group of flu turned up, then they would have had uh, uh, had difficulty. Um, I, th I think there, there, there's some depend. Uh, there, there's there's enough data to to to, to lead to the conclusion that I've, I've shown you um, about uh, exactly what the age. Um, uh, profile is uh, of the vulnerable uh, sort of cohorts of people uh, following each of these uh, uh, pandemics. So, so, so in, the, in the paper on well, first flu is forever, then uh, we had this watershed in 1968, which was the, the, the Hong Kong flu. So, so, so they, yeah, so, they're, they're, so uh, um, uh, there, there would be some, some special uh, distinction made if, if it was the pandemic. But having said that, if, if you caught the the, the strain a few years later, then th that would still be what's uh, imprinted on your immune system. So we've got a couple more questions. Thank you. Excellent paper, Emil Stipp. Um, I was just wondering, in practice, um, is there enough time between when the flu, uh, the seasonal flu emerges to know what type it is to when you can take action? So if it's called a, a Aussie flu, does that mean that it developed there first and people down under are basically done for if they were born in the, in the wrong year? Well, but you well, can still part, take part action the, elsewhere. The, the, the takeaway from this presentation um, is that um, when, and this is something which the National Health Service did not do, okay, which, which they could have done, which is everyone knew what Aussie flu was, H3N2, and of course there was this blanket um, suggestion that people should get vaccinated, but there's no age distinction. Right, there was, and the, the, the key point there was that because it was Aussie flu, because it was H3N2, we knew exactly what the most vulnerable um, parts of the population were. They, they were uh, young people, um, say, who, who might have been exposed to the pandemic in 2009. And um, 
uh, people who were uh, born before 1968, uh, older people, okay, who had been, uh, whose, whose first flu exposure would have been to group one. Um, so the, the National Health Service, in principle, could have been uh, more targeted in terms of advice to people about vaccination, which they weren't, essentially, because they, they basically was just get vaccinated. Okay, whereas in fact, um, uh, this, uh, essentially this kind of, of knowledge is something which could be used uh, um, to uh, improve public health. Right, but, uh, yeah, well, one last question. Uh, Yang Yong from C3. Um, I, I'm just curious, you talked about the fatality for the 28 year old for the 1918 flu, but it's part of like incidences. I was wondering whether how much of the incidence actually played a role. There's a, some people argue that uh, because the different behavior by different age group may have had a different instance experiences. So old age people, if they, they know there's a flu outside, they may just stay home. But younger people, they still have to go to work. So that's why they might catch incidences. So wonder how much of the incidence played a role. In no, that's a very good question. Essentially, the question was about uh, uh, how much does sort of individual human behavior uh, uh, have uh, some uh, effect on, on the kind of uh, age uh, dependence of the pandemic. Well, the simple fact is, and I have shown you, is, is that if you look at the actual data on the, the age, ages of, of, of the victims, obviously you see the, these, this, this sort of clear spike at, at, at certain ages in different parts of the world, like in New York and, and um, in, uh, uh, in, uh, um, in, in Canada uh, and, and so on. And the... Um, uh, um, Essentially, the, this, the, the actual uh, data on, and of course we, we saw it again with, with the, 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 uh, the slide from First Fruits Forever, where we've got this, the markedly different age profiles of the victims from age 5 and 1 and age 7 and 9. So, the, so I should say that the, the studies undertaken by these virologists have been extremely rigorous uh, and, uh, and diligent. And uh, I mean, that's the reason why it's taken so long to, uh, to get to these conclusions, because it has taken a lot of really hard work by the scientists in order to uh, unravel the data and to give us this, uh, um, this information. So, so the point about this, the whole story is that it's a combination of natural data observations and also the kind of basic virological understanding of, of why it is um, that um, uh, um, um, this, uh, this particular vi this kind of vulnerability uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, to the first flu should have come about. So, it's, so uh, it, it's really an interdisciplinary type of investigation involving both um, those who have gone out in the field to, to um, collect the data on uh, the victims, but also uh, there's been uh, some, some fascinating uh, serological studies, uh, that, i.e. the study of, of, um, uh, of, of uh, the actual um, uh, uh, the virus itself uh, in, in uh, people's blood and so on, which, which has, uh, has led to this uh, understanding. So I wouldn't be standing here now if, if it weren't for the fact that, that, that there's really a mountain of evidence now uh, supporting this. Okay, th thanks very much, Gordon. Um, thanks very much for the, qu the questions. Uh, it's time to move on to, to the, the final and last uh, uh, presentation. <laughs> The, the final talk is, uh, is a paper written by Sabrina Link on long-term care reform in, in Germany uh, at long last. Um, Tim Embert uh, works for Gen Re and he's a senior actuary uh, with more than 10 years experience as a product specialist for long-term care and critical illness products and experience as an account manager in, for Germany and Singapore. Tim holds a degree in economical mathematics at the University of Bella Field and is a member of the German Actuarial Association. So thanks very much, Tim. Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, you may wonder why there are two names, so I'm obviously not Sabrina Link. Um, she did all the work with the presentation, except that I had to shorten it to fit it into the time slot, but she's now on maternity leave, but I wanted to give credit to her because she had really quite a lot of work on this topic during the last um, years for January for us. Um, so, at long last, um, we will see in a few slides why um, we chose this topic um, or this title for the presentation. Um, we're talking about German long-term care insurance and um, so I would like at first give you a small introduction into the German social security system and 
how the old long-term care system looked like before I can then explain the changes and then in the last step see what this means for private insurance um, and hopefully that also gives some interesting insights for the UK. So Germany um, is very proud of having one of the first social security systems in the world and the newest member is long-term care um, who joined in 1995 and this was seen as a century reform at this time, um, so really a big step forward due to changing demographics. However, ever since the introduction of this ATC system, um, there was a lot of criticism on how the assessment was designed and that took some time then until it was changed. How does this structure look like? Um, so the long-term care insurance in Germany, at first there was this compulsory part, so literally every person in Germany has some kind of long-term care insurance. Um, and this follows the German health insurance system. And as our health insurance system is a bit weird, our long-term care insurance structure is also a bit weird. So I'm sorry for that. But 90% are covered under the public <coughs> sickness fund in health insurance. And then the compulsory long-term care insurance is also under this public sickness fund. And then the other 10% roughly have private health insurance. So if you earn a lot of money or if you're in certain occupations, you can choose to opt out of the um, public health system and into private health. And then you have this system. The benefits for long-term care insurance are completely identical. It's just that um, the sickness funds, are, um, they are pay-as-you-go funded, while the other ones are um, really a funded system and you have medical underwriting in that. On top of this, there is private long-term care insurance and um, this is then divided into the health insurance branch and the life insurance branch. Um, there are more policies as we will see in a few slides for health insurance and this is because A, um, the compulsory long-term care insurance scheme follows the health insurance system, so this is like a natural partner to talk to. And on the other hand, this is um, they, because they can offer the premiums a lot cheaper because they don't have to give guarantees and they can use um, a different interest rate, which is for a long-term saving product, for long-term care, um, quite an important factor. But on the other hand, then the life insurance products are much more stable in pricing and can offer different features. A short look, so there are two principles for compulsory long-term care insurance. Um, the first one is home health care over nursing home care. And I guess this has two motivations. The first one is most people prefer, uh, prefer to stay at home as long as they can. Um, and so if you want to have some system which is accepted, you do that. Um, and this means they also pay some of the, of the benefits to people who stay at home and not only for nursing home care. And the other one um, is obviously it's cheaper to offer some, some nursing or some, some professional help at home than to offer um, a full nursing home place. So both from consumer perspective and from, from the government perspective, that's a good thing to do. The next one is it's a partial coverage insurance, the compulsory LTC. So it was never intended to cover all of the costs. Mostly it said roughly it's covering half of the cost. We will see that later on. Um, but that means there has always been room for additional private long-term care insurance. And this is, I guess, one of the first lessons we learned is um, while long-term care is also a niche, uh, niche market in Germany, it still is one of the biggest top-up markets um, or additional long-term care, private long-term care insurance markets in the world. Um, so I would say the permanent discussion on the benefits and lacks of the um, social system were helping the industry here. Um, here you can see for financing that the contribution rate increased over time and is likely to increase as well. And um, the major driver for this is obviously demographics. Um, but on the other hand, this is not the only reason. It's also that um, Partly there have been new benefits added and um, so the scheme has become more generous and also inflation adjusted. So we will see how this develops over time. Um, but this is something where the people from the private part of the social, uh, of the compulsory long-term care insurance always say, see, better come to us, we are um, 
well, we build a fund that is more stable, and then with the decreasing interesting rates over the last years, um, well, this became a more, more even discussion. So how did the um, old system work, just very briefly? So they mainly looked into kind of activities of daily living, you could say, so personal hygiene, nutrition, and mobility. And also, in addition to that, they looked at how much um, household help did you need. And then, depending on how often do you need the care, do you just need it um, at least once per day to get into the lowest care level with, a, um, with the lowest benefits, or do you need it um, permanently, even at night, you can go into care level one, two, three, so it was a system with three levels of care. Um, and they also looked at the minutes you need per care, um, per day for care. And then they also said uh, most of these minutes must come from the activities of daily living and only a limited number of this time is calculated for the household help. Under these conditions, you would be able to, um, to receive money from the old system. Here's an example for washing. And what you can see is um, that they split the, this task up. So um, it's even, even more granular in the end with toothbrushing and things like that. But they split the whole body up into upper body, lower body, and then hands washing, face washing. And they said, how much time would a layman need to help, um, help the dependent person to get the care level that they need? Um, to be appropriately clean in this example. So this, this, uh, this old definition um, was criticized from the beginning, as I mentioned, and mainly for two reasons. The one reason is um, that it's clearly ADL-focused, and with old age, there is a lot of people um, who may be physically able to perform these ADLs, but if they develop Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia, they may need constant supervision. And yes, people with severe dementia after time would have gotten a care level after all under this scheme, um, but it would take them quite long. And so this was thought of being not adequate. The other reason is this minute keeping um, for two effects. The first one is that people criticize if I only pay for these minutes, then people will own, the caregivers will only have time to, to use this, this amount of minutes and there's no time for more holistic care. So no talking to the people and maybe listening to them and activating. Um, you may argue that this is maybe more a question of funding than of um, how this is measured, but still this was a major criticism. And the second point um, for this point was that you measured how much care was actually needed, which seems very fair at first, but it happened that, for example, a person would need help in climbing the stairs, so you write down, for example, 10, 15 minutes a day for climbing stairs, and later on this person um, was bedridden when the condition worsened, so you don't need time to help him um, climbing stairs, and there were some cases who, um, where, the, where the physical abilities declined, but they got a lower care level. And that was perceived as very unfair, as you can imagine, by these families, even though you could argue, yes, from a technical point, this is um, correct. So um, we've seen quite a number of changes over time, but these were all smaller changes to the system. Um, so like adding small benefits for people with dementia or with other mental illnesses, um, maybe increasing the benefits a bit and things like that. Um, but the major change was to define a new assessment. And as I said, the discussion started in 1995. And then in 2006, there was the first commission um, who said, yes, let's discuss this broadly with all the experts, what would really be the best achievable definition of people being in need of care. And this took until 2015, until it was passed. And in 2017, it was implemented. So yes, this is why we called it um, the new long-term care scheme at long last, because it really took three ministers of health um, to bring this through. Because A, it's a very complex measure, and B, it's very expensive if you really want to give better care to a lot of people, and not just saying, OK, let's, um, 
let's change the pot from, from, the less, from the physical disabilities to the mental disabilities. And what were the key changes um, for the new definition? Well, you can see that the amount of care, so the minute taking that needed to be abolished, that was clear from the start, so instead they say we define the degree of dependence, or they now even say the degree of independence, because in the second step um, you wanted to go away from the deficit orientation to the abilities. And this is something I will not touch on very deeply here, um, but as I said, if you want to encourage people to stay with their strengths, then this is from, from an assessment point, it makes sense. Even though um, for the question, how much money do you get, it's not really a difference whether you say, well, these are the levels which can still be met or these are the levels which cannot be met anymore. Um, so they moved away from the ADL to a much more comprehensive um, understanding of care. We will see this on the next slide. And the three care levels moved to five care grades. So um, the aim was to have some more differentiation. Whether you call it care levels or care grades is more or less the same. They just wanted to show it's a new system so you don't get confused all the time. Um, and the lowest care level would definitely include people who did not receive any benefits in the past um, or were not even identified as being in need of care. And then there's the actual given care need, which we discussed in the example with the ADL failure, and now it's the theoretical abilities of the person. So it's no matter whether the house has stairs or does not have stairs, um, just whether the person could use the legs. Um, so they developed eight modules. Here you can only see six modules. Why is it six modules? Because two model, uh, modules are not, using for, are not used for defining the grades, but are just um, for additional information. And what you can see is that the top two models, the self-supply and the mobility, they are still, um, let's say, on the physical abilities and ADL-likes, and they are responsible for roughly 50%, but then we have dealing with requirements due to illness, organization of daily life, cognitive and communicative abilities, and behavior in psychiatric problems. Um, so really a strong focus on non-physical um, abilities and disabilities. If you look carefully, um, you may see that this does not add up to 100%. And this is one example of complexity when you talk to many people and have to come up with a compromise. It's 115%, um, no, but for the, um, for the lowest two, for module two and module three, um, it's just the higher value of the two is taken into the ranking. So here's an example, or uh, here's how this is transferred. You use the six modules um, for the level two and three. You take the higher one and you use the weighting you saw on the previous slide. And then you come up with a point system. And if you've got 90 to 100 points, you're in care grade five. And if you've got zero points, well, then you are active. So hopefully most of us would achieve zero points um, at the moment. Um, yeah, this point system with the thresholds was a very nice trick because that allowed politicians to say, okay, let's define good levels of care first and then when we have a pot of money to share and we see, oh, there would be too many people getting into grade two or grade three, you could just rearrange the points for the thresholds and then um, you could adjust this to, your, um, to the money you have. What you can also see is that there is a special rule for the highest care grade as I said, it's either above 90 points or it's loss of legs and loss of arms. And there you can see that some people in the end had the feeling that, well, maybe this is stressing the ADL. It's not enough anymore. Um, so if somebody is losing both arms and both legs, then he definitely needs intensive care. Um, and in this case, he should be um, graded as, as um, grade five which would not necessarily be the case um, with, the, with the system as described before. One question that arose um, was that Germany had a system implemented with more than two million people in need of care already, and what to do with the old people in need of care? Would you like to reassess everyone? That would be one first step, but um, there are again two reasons why you why they decided not to do that. The first one was, um, well, it's again a lot of work. 
and if you want to implement the system quickly, then you have to have a simple rule. And the other one is that um, the two systems, they are not aligned very well because we have the ADL focus in the old scheme and we have the, more, the stronger focus on dementia in the new system. So it might be that um, people who were in the highest care grade before would, um, would only get a lower care level um, in the new system. So that would be a political catastrophe. There was one, um, there was one um, published paper, which we can see later on, where you could clearly see that these effects would have occurred. So they just said, no, at the beginning, everybody who's now in care level one becomes at least care grade two, and so on and so on, that you see um, there's a clear and easy rule. And politicians could say nobody's worse off than before. Um, and then for people with EA, that's with a limited ability to cope with daily life, they would be shifted even higher. Here's an example of, um, or, or here's an, a short excerpt of the benefits you can get. And you can see that there is benefits for home health care and for nursing home care. And the benefits clearly increase with the care grade. So there's a tiered system. And this tiered system is also adopted um, then typically by private insurance. What is interesting now is if you look at the actual costs, then the actual costs are much higher for you in the nursing home, uh, for, for professional home health care. So there's still a gap of about, let's say, 1,000 euro maybe. Um, so still there is a clear need for additional insurance cover. Interesting now is that in the new system, um, they designed it that the nursing homes, um, they can only charge a fixed amount from, um, from the dependents independent of the level of care. And that was completely different in the past where this level increased. And now for new business, that means for life insurance, we have to ask ourselves, um, does it still make sense to offer step benefits, which increase with the care level, or are people better off um, just getting, just getting a flat amount. So this is the situation for, um, for the government system. And now we take a look at the life insurance. For health insurance, it's easy because they have everything adjustable. And on the other hand, they have to follow the new system. Um, so yes, they had to do some actuarial calculations as well. But for them, it was less a strategic question. Um, for life insurance, what they developed in the past was they had typically an ADA trigger. They had copied the social system, the old one, um, but said, we don't, follow, we don't follow automatically any changes because they were aware that some changes were comics and, uh, coming and that would not fit to the guarantees. And they had a dementia trigger because um, otherwise dementia was not well covered. <coughs> Um, and this was then, as there were the three care levels um, by the social system, this was also split up into a tiered benefit context. So, for example, you would receive 100% if you fail six of six ADLs, 50% if you fail four of six ADLs, or are in care level two, or have dementia, and you would maybe get 25% in some products if you are in care, grade, uh, care level one or failing two of six ADLs. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, has Germany been successfully in selling this private long-term care insurance? It is still a niche market. Um, long-term care is not so easy to sell. But if you look at the numbers, then we have more than three and a half million sold policies um, for the non-compulsory part. So it is quite a large market. And um, as I told you before, the health insurance is in a better position due to cheaper rates and, um, and um, for the, being the natural partner due to the compulsory scheme. Um, but even for the, for the life insurance, we can see that on the small basis, there was quite a strong growth in the years up to 2015 with 27% per annum increase. So for many big life insurers, um, they either didn't care or they said, well, yes, we have to have it in a portfolio, but it's not of strategic importance. Um, but there are some small players for whom this is really a major driver, and they white label it for other companies. Um, and they are quite happy with having this product. 
Now the question arose, what do we do with this new situation? Um, so how do the old and the new definition compare? It was clear that when the new definition is, um, is taken into the plan, uh, place, into the market, um, then the market players, at least the ones for, for whom this business is important, they wanted to have a pricing ready. Um, so we had to come up with some pricing ideas in the market. Um, but also, what do we do with the enforced business? Do we want to change it from the old world to the new world? Or should we keep it to the old world? And um, so, as I said, for health, this is not a question, but for life insurance, as this was something which was dawning for ages, a few years ago, um, marketing people were afraid that they could not sell the old definitions anymore because it was apparent that a new definition was going to come. So they added clauses like, if we are going to offer a new tariff, then you will have the chance to change. Um, so at least for these people, um, for these people, it was really something to think about. And when you imagine that there were people who had an ADL trigger, and some companies just sold ADL and, and the social security system, for example, um, how do you transfer this to the new system? What you say to somebody, well, you can change, um, and, and as long as you don't get, uh, get benefits from the old system, and then this is a person with some early dementia signs, they could say, yes, of course I want to change, and then under the new scheme they would di uh, directly be able to benefit. Or how do they react? Um, so this is why, um, as the new system was not just adding one top layer or one bottom layer, it was quite difficult for them to decide, and that's why um, still many of the old blocks of business are, um, are using the old definitions today. Maybe something on pricing. Um, we had some information on pricing from the studies because they had 10 years' time and the government wanted to know how much it costs. So we could see this is the distribution of the old definition, that is the distribution of the new definition. Um, but at least in this publication, you could not see how this really interacted. But there was a second publication, and here you could see very nicely that there are really um, cases. So PG means um, Pflegegrad, this is the new system. And PS, Pflegestufe, is the old system with the three levels. And red ones would be people who are worse off than before, and the blue ones are the people who are better off than before. And green one is like roughly the same benefit. And there are really like 27%, for example, for current care level one um, who would be worse off if there wasn't this, um, this rule from the ministry for automatic transfer. But now, if you think of long-term care, that you do not only have the incidence rates, but you have to check what does it mean for mortality as well. Um, this was quite, uh, quite a piece of work to derive some rates for this. And another question um, would be in the future, how do we deal with the, with the old cases which use the old definition? For dementia, we are fine because this is covered in the new assessment. For the ADLs, we think we can also derive this from the old assessment, but in 10 or 20 years' time, um, there may be nobody left who is used to the old SGB system, so, uh, to the old definition. So there's the question, um, will it become easier to, or will it become more difficult to assess these people, and would there be claims um, that we do not treat them fairly? The last bit um, was that we had also to think about if this new definition is more generous than before, um, that there are people we did not see. So they would not try to, to claim for the old care system, but now they will go into the system because they know they have better chances. And um, the government at first changed, uh, guessed it would be around 500,000 people. The actuary said it should be around 800,000. In the first year of the implementation, we now saw 550,000 extra people, and we guess that, uh, <clears throat> that there will be some, some extra um, people coming in, so that it takes like two or three years to see the full picture. So the truth is probably somewhere in the middle already. Yeah, so coming to my conclusions, what does it mean? Um, for Germany, what does it mean for you, also for the UK maybe? So first, um, the compulsory long-term care insurance, I think does more good than harm um, also to the private long-term care insurance market. 
So if you are now awaiting a green paper and are discussing um, how could things go on in Great Britain, I think it's, um, it's a good thing not only for the society but also for, um, for, the, actual, uh, for the actuarial insurance industry to participate and um, yeah, to, to actively um, accompany this process. Secondly, good thing will Weile haben, so it takes a long while um, for things to ripen, especially if you talk about long-term care, um, because this is so complex, and um, if the state is, um, is included, then don't, don't reckon that this is a change within one year, but it may be worth um, to be prepared. Also, um, yes, the care needs, uh, seems to be better now, or better reflected than the old one, but a better assessment is not the same as better care. So now we've got the next discussion in Germany, it's a, bit, a big topic because still there are people missing who can give care, and so there's still, still a similar need. You still need money to get care, and you still need people who can give the care. So this is not going away, no matter how good or bad your definition is. And last, lastly, care touches the whole society, and um, that means, yes, it's very complex and it's very political, and if you've got something you need to decide, do you want to make something which is independent of the state system in the end, or do you want to lean on that um, with all the changes that are included? Thanks a lot. Thanks, Tim. So it's time for then to get any questions to put their hands up. No, it's been a long evening. <laughs> um, oh, Paul. Yeah. Um, hi, Paul Brett. Have you got any idea what the 3.5 will go up to uh, ultimately the, for the state system? I think you said it was currently three, if I remember the figure. Uh, the you, contribution rate. Was ah, it? so the contribution rate, um, there's now the discussion again to increase it by another half percentage because they want to um, give more money to the caregivers now because they are seeing we have quite a lot of people in need of care. Um, but not enough people giving care, so we need to give them more money, and so the contribution rate is very likely to go up by half a percent in the near future. And then there are projections, and I think like in 10 or 20 years' time, there will be a lot more people when all the um, baby boomers get into the age where they need care. Then it will get problematic. Um, and then it's always a discussion of social society, how much do you want to pay? I mean, you could say, okay, we reduce the, the amount of benefit and people have to increase the share they pay for themselves. Or you could say, we take all this and then it will go higher, more than 1% higher than now. And any other questions? I mean, I've, I've, uh, I've got a quick question, Tim. Um, this market you've got, it's 9% covered by the state and 10% covered by privately. Roughly, is that how, how it works? Because my question is, um, do people have to take up the private cover, is, is one question, and, and how sustainable is that cost into the future? Because it's, it's, it's paid on a yearly basis as well, isn't it? Yeah, so the 90 and 10%, as I said, we've got a strange system, so either you are covered in the one or in the other. So, for example, I'm, um, I'm covered by a local um, sickness fund, and I don't have any private long-term care insurance, um, and otherwise, if my health insurance, so for example, if I would be a teacher, then with more than 90% chance, I would have a private health insurance, and I would also have private long-term care insurance. Um, and they face different problems. The one is facing the problems from the pay-as-you-go system with different demographics, and um, the other one is facing challenges when we see declining interest rates, for example. Okay. Right. No? Thanks, Tim. Any, any other questions? Yeah, Ian.
Thank you, Tim. Um, I found that fascinating, and certainly reading the full paper um, earlier on this year, I found fascinating too. And it's particularly relevant here in the UK where we're having a green paper to talk about how we um, tackle the problem, the demographic um, problem of long-term care coming forward, and indeed this is true around the developed world, of course, not just here in the UK or in Germany. Um, I, I think there will be a debate here in the UK, as there is on a number of things, on hypothecated taxes, by which I mean um, taxes um, designed specifically to provide a particular benefit, rather than having taxes which go into the whole pot and the government chooses how to spend it. Um, clearly, in this case, um, Germany has come up with, or feels it's necessary to have a hypothecated tax, would you believe that's a better system than just putting everything into a big pot and let the government decide how each are spent? This is a, this is a very political question because <laughs> the question is how much do you trust your government to keep the, keep the money and, and enough money um, and maybe you are in a better position to judge the UK government than I am. Um, having said that, um, Germany has a system where it's well, it's taxes, but as it's social security, not all the money is included. And there is a discussion whether it wouldn't be better to really use a part of the taxes so that everybody is, has to pay and that you're not only using income taxes, um, so to say, but also people from, well, um, if you've got a lot of money and, and, uh, and generate other sources of income, that this is taxed as well. And that might make it more stable. I guess the question is, apart from who can change the amount of money and use it for, for other purposes? Um, how can you generate a constant stream of income um, in an aging population when there is a shift between people who are retired and people who are still working? Okay, any, any further questions before we, we wrap up? Okay, on that note, um, I just sort of, uh, sort of summarise the three talks we've had. We started off uh, with Ross and Adele talking about digital technology and disability claims and how that can be used to help manage the claims and some of the issues insurers will have trying to engage with all the startups. Um, the second talk from Gordon, I learned that um, I've got to go to the doctors and uh, work out exactly what I've been exposed to. <laughs> and if there's another so if the pandemic coming along, I'll get the right vaccination. Um, but yeah, it's a very interesting talk, basically on the first flu is the one that lasts forever, the, the key, the key strap line there. And finally, long-term care is sort of quite a timely paper because obviously the UK government is going to launch a green paper soon on social care in the UK. So it's an interesting example um, of how the German market works. It would be good to sort of pick up some of the lessons there and feed that, that into that, the, the consultation when it comes up. So thanks very much. So it just remains for me to express my, my, my own thanks to all the, the contributors, uh, the audience tonight, and also to all the, the presenters. Uh, so a round of applause. Thanks.